So we're on the road up to El Valle now off the Pan American Highway. What they've been doing since we, since our last trip down here, once they started finding these dead and dying frogs, is set up a, a field hospital, like a mass unit really, to do some triage, emergency treatments of these sick frogs. For the Panamanian Frog Project to be a success, Hola, Hola. Ron and Joe rely on local herpetologist and newfound friend, Edgardo Griffith. Ron and Joe, they asked me if I was interested in working at a conservation. When they told me the idea, I was like, this is crazy, but I like it. Because it's not just go to meetings and say what we're going to do. They actually wanted to do something. Ron and Joe's emergency evacuation of wild amphibians now serves as a model for future chytrid sites. So, Eduardo, you're bleaching the plants, right? I heard. Yes. Yeah. Great. Frogs infected with chytrid can be treated in captivity. The solution is called itraconazole, a fungicide similar to athlete's foot medication. The treatment lasts for 10 days, 10 minutes a day. This is great, what we're looking at here. Everything's organized, everything's clean, everything's numbered. Really, really impressive, really impressive. The unfortunate thing is, if you have frogs that have been treated that are cured, it doesn't impart resistance. So if you wanted to put those frogs back in the wild, they would basically become reinfected and die. So until we figure out how to impart resistance or how to selectively treat or get rid of chytrid in the wild, there's very little potential to reintroduce frogs at this moment. So we're here at, uh, at Rio Maria, and this will be our first glimpse of the effects of chytrid here in El Valle, where it's moved in just in the past few months. So this will be the first time we'll see uh, what the effects have been. I appreciate the interconnectivity of everything in the forest. It's like you're walking through a huge organism and you're, you see all the different organs and, and blood vessels that you know are interconnected in some way and in, in many ways we don't even understand. Their first emotion, anticipation. Their second, disbelief. Although it's not raining right now, which is a really good time to find glass frogs, I'd expect to see a couple here and there. We haven't seen a single one. Finally, Edgardo spots one. We used to find five or six different species together hanging around this place a couple months ago. And now this is just the first one that we find in 20 minutes. They swab the frog to test for chytrid, but don't collect it. A frog this sluggish will not survive treatment. You don't even have to, to say anything. You just feel it. What every single one of us would feel in that moment is just horrible. Right here, we have a katydid. Frogs love to eat these guys. And you think about ecosystem effects in both directions. We saw a snake that's going to pretty soon not have any frogs to eat. And we have these guys that all of a sudden won't have any frogs to eat them. As they continue to survey the damage, oh, here's right here. Here's right here. they happen upon a rare discovery. So this is the famous Panamanian golden frog. This is probably one of the last of the wild Panamanian golden frogs that we could find. The golden frog is the national symbol of Panama, but a combination of overcollecting, habitat loss, and the chytrid fungus has virtually wiped them off the planet. We've seen a million pictures of these things. There's nothing like seeing one in person. I could stand here for three hours looking at this thing. Strong enough to survive treatment, this frog they collect. The number of people I've had come up to me in the United States and say, 
When I was a kid, or even just a few years ago, it used to be always frogs calling in the backyard, and it was such a great summer sound. And I'm not hearing so much of that anymore. What's, what's going on? People are noticing. They're noticing that they're not hearing the sound that they grew up with. It's a, it's a beautiful sound, come on. Sitting on a rocking chair and hearing one frog, one lonely frog off in a bush going wah wah, wah wah. That just, if you're sitting there by yourself, how can you not connect with that frog, even though you never even see it? All right, so here we are at El Nispro Zoo, and we're about to see the EVAC Center for the first time. This is great. This is the first center of its kind in Panama and one of the very first in Latin America. Let's go check it out. In August 2005, the Houston Zoo began construction on Panama's own captive breeding facility and nature education center. Como persona, pues siento que es una gran lástima que las ranas doradas u otras ranas en particular hayan ido desapareciendo. Este era un proyecto que no era solo para la conservación de especies nativas del Valle y de Panamá, sino que era un problema realmente mundial. Entonces creo que era una gran oportunidad. This is really, really nice. This is really, 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 really nice. No more hotel rooms for the frogs. Now they have a real... <laughs> This is a big grasshopper I just found. He, uh, he's going to contribute to the world of amphibian conservation here real soon. For now, Ron and Joe are taking it day by day. Executing a project without precedence has its hurdles and its critics. But sometimes I think that people get the wrong impression that you know all we want to do is put all these things in captivities and zoos and aquariums and botanical gardens. And that's not really the case. It's simply a stopgap. Um, so that we keep a few species on the planet for a little bit longer while these other threats are being addressed. Ron and I put our professional reputations on the line for doing something that no one has ever done before and specifically making a point of it. Not making a point of, look at us, look how cool we are. Making a point of saying, if nobody does something differently, nothing is going to change. We're going to keep losing amphibians. Everything's going to start crashing and crashing and crashing, and at the end, we won't have frogs. We don't know why these landslides happen, or why, why is it rain so hard, and it doesn't matter how smart or, or how big our houses or how strong our cars are. We're just another species that live here, and we don't respect our environment, and we're going to pay for it. I think the best case scenario is for us to engage local people to preserve their own species in their backyards. And places like the Atlanta Botanical Garden, Houston Zoo, Zoo Atlanta, the Nisbro Zoo, to do what they can with the resources they have to give these things a little more time on the planet. That's the best case scenario. That's, that's the best we can do.